Hello and welcome to this edition of Bayou Time. I'm your host, Keith Weissite, licensed clinical social worker with Terrebonne Home Care. Very glad you're joining us, however you may be joining us. We appreciate it very, very much. And I, one of those people that doesn't always get a good glimpse or knowing about what happens through and with politics, we're very glad to have with us those state representatives that can tell us those things. We welcome back to the program a State Representative Beryl Amadee, District 51. Beryl, thank you for joining us again. Thanks, Keith. It's always fun to come and talk. I appreciate that. Look, a lot of people, they think they know what happens for you when you all start session, which is uh, very soon here. Tell us a little bit, if you don't mind, give us that. That, that overview, that snapshot of what it's like for you as a representative going into session? Well, there's a whole lot of preparation in that in, in a session like we have this year, which is a fiscal only session, right. any bills that we want to bring that are not tax and spend related have to be filed early. So it's been really hectic for the past month or so trying to finish the drafting and get all the details in order for any of our non-budget bills because they were due um, a week ago, a week ago and right. so now I get to finally settle down and work on my budget bills while at the same time getting ready to head for Baton Rouge. Right, and it's a limited number. There are a limited number of bills that can be put in that are not budget related, right? That's correct. We each get five, five. as a maximum, and it sounds like it might mean we only have a few bills because we each only get five, but you have to do the math. Mm -hmm. There's there's 105 of us, right? And so um, five times that could be a lot. It's 560. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, I didn't want to just say right yeah, on top. Yeah, yeah. But gotcha. uh, it's, it's, the the total number of bills per session on average can be between 1,200 and 1,700. And so what I find interesting is watching the bills as they roll in, as they're being published. So um, now we are past the pre-filed deadline, and as of this morning, there are a total of 833 bills already filed, including a few resolutions. Wow. And so we know there are more to come. Right, so right. if we meet the, the minimum average of about 1,200, that means we're only two thirds of the way there. We've got a whole nother third still rolling in as the session begins. And uh, those, uh, those budget related bills can be filed even a few weeks into session. Okay, okay, so they can do that as you begin. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that, that Z, Jerome, certainly, uh, very involved, very involved with the budget. They are actually already involved in some work and doing some hearings now, right? Yes, um, I'm told that it was kind of new with our incoming class of the legislature, which was in 2016, when we came in facing that $2 billion shortfall. Right. Um, that um, we started to have budget hearings earlier than when session began, session began right. the Appropriations Committee receives, or I think it's joint budget, receives the governor's proposed budget uh, near the end of January. And so before the session even began, we called in each department and agency and we asked them the question. So how is your department or agency going to function with the dollar amount that the governor has proposed, whether it was higher or lower? And in most cases, it represented a cut. Right. And so we've continued that. It, it really helps us to get a lot of information to make the decisions on the budget as far as how those agencies and departments operate, as far as their total number of staff, as far as what is their revenue coming from, how mm -hmm. much is coming from the state general fund, right. how much is from fees and self-generated funds, and so on. So it's, it's very um, instructional, informational, right. to have these hearings. And to do them starting when session begins would take weeks, and we would be halfway through session before we even start to deal with the budget. So that's right. why we have them early. Well, and again, it's so much work. It's one of those things where I don't, I think people think, oh, okay, they're about to start work. They're about to go into session. Wrong. It is so much harder because like you said, you've got to get your bills, those five that are not related to the budget turned in beforehand, at least a week beforehand. And then those hearings that, that people like, like uh, Z are involved in uh, ahead of time as well. And those organizations have to be able to get a review to see who's going to do what. I love the fact that we're starting early and really preparing ourselves, and it's about being better prepared for going into session. Yes, and, and also for being able to deal with such a huge and complicated budget. Yeah. You can't just have them throw something on your desk and, and look through it and be ready to vote the next day. The budget is, when it's printed, it's pages and pages long right. in, its, um, in its form that it's presented to the legislature early on. and. Um, it has so many moving parts. It's just not something you can do quickly. Right. And, and then the other aspect of that, especially with the fiscal session, is very often we'll find that there's some 
um, language in some of the bills that you got to be really careful about before you vote yay or nay. Oh, yeah. On them, yeah. because it just kind of requires us to be able to say, "All right, let me let me read this in its entirety, so that there's not something that's kind of." And I don't say that people are sneaking things in, but there's sometimes it, it could happen, right? When it may when, not be the intent, right? When and just whatever that that you know, it may because of happenstance or just because it's part of that. It's just kind of other things kind of get slid in. You've got to be very vigilant about that. And I love the fact yeah. that our representatives are. Yes, and, and we feel that it's very important to make an informed vote. It's, the budget is not something we take lightly. And even though every other year is a fiscal-only year, that's about tax and spending. About the budget, we have to pass a budget every year, and mm -hmm. every year that budget has to be balanced. Right. And if it's not, we have to call ourselves back into a special session to get the job done. Right, and, and, and we, we've seen that. We've seen that situation, and, and we here in Louisiana have had our struggles being able to balance and manage the budget, it's just been very difficult to do. You very well prepared going into session, uh, but let's talk a little bit about some of the bills that you'll be proposing. Okay, sure. When we're going into a fiscal only session, we each only get five slots for non-fiscal bills. Right. And just so you know that I've narrowed mine down to five, but I start with a list of like 37. Holy and cow. They, they've all gotta be considered and, and researched and I have to figure out which ones yeah. need to run now. Maybe there are certain deadlines right. and which ones can wait till later. Right. And, um, and of course, this is an election year. So yeah. so, there's so that more, question. Right. Yeah, exactly. Will so there be many, a later? Right. Yes. Exactly. Do I get a chance to do that? So right. we got to kind of prioritize that, that 37 into f only five. Only five. It's like trying to choose your favorite grandchild. I mean, you just oh, can't do it. we're not going to go there. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't asking that, right, but it's just right. difficult to do. Yes. Well, speaking of grandchildren, the, the bills become uh, very personal mm. when you've put wow. in all the time in the research. And sometimes you bring them because it's an issue that's personal to you, or other times you bring them because it's an issue that someone, maybe a constituent, has requested and urgently needs. So, wow. Yeah. So every bill has its own little personality and its own little... Okay. Place in our let's, hearts. Let's talk about your babies. Okay. okay. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll go in the order that they've been assigned in the house okay. by number. This okay. is in not no necessarily way, important. There you go. I got you. Yeah. Okay. We're so, not choosing uh, the favorite here. Nope. nope. Okay. Now some people may have theirs. Sure. So. Gotcha. All right. So House Bill 121 is about recess. As you know, in years past, I've brought bills to try to bring back recess in school systems or in schools where they've done away with it or where they've reduced it down to just a tiny couple of minutes a day. Now, this bill is going to require that lower elementary, that would be um, kindergarten through fifth grade, okay. have a minimum of 30 minutes. I'm sorry, 30 is what I wanted. Right. Uh, 15 <laughs> minutes per day. That's a minimum. They can have more. Right. But 15 minutes per day minimum. And the recess has to be complete, free, unstructured time. It, it can't be a time where they say at recess, we, we are going this. to play right. this game. It, the children have to be free to just do as they please within reason, um, and supervised, of course. Right. But if they want to run and, and jump, fine. If they want to take a nap, fine. It needs to be up to them. Right. And um, this is going to also amend a part of the law so that the schools will be able to count that 15 minutes towards their required number of instructional Section. minutes per day. Right. So hopefully this year we can finally move this through. Look, we, we've got all these labor laws that say that we have to take a break. Mm -hmm. We have to take a break from learning or structured um, work. Work. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to have that free play. It is so very healthy for them emotionally. Yes. Great bill. Yes. So that's um, 121. And, and in our area, the schools that I'm familiar with still have some recess. Right. So we may not see a significant change based on this bill within my district, maybe here or there. Right. But um, in other parts of the states, there of the state, there are districts that have no recess. None. And I can't even imagine. Right. Um, so the next bill is House Bill 152. And this one is a constitutional amendment that says that parental rights are fundamental. And mm. so, um, as you know, let's do a little constitutional background here. Okay. Um, our rights are not given by our Constitution. Our rights are given by God. Constitutions are written to protect our God-given rights from the government taking them away. Okay. And so a constitutional amendment that says that parental rights are fundamental is, is placing parental rights at the highest level. Uh, it means that 
whenever any government action is, is planned, you know, when, when we draft laws concerning children, we're going to have to be sure that it meets the highest standards that um, the, the legal term is strict scrutiny. Okay. And that means that when, when a government considers, in this case it'll be a state constitutional amendment, so when the state legislature considers a law uh, concerning parents and children, we'll have to be sure that it's, um, it's not just a rational law, it's not just a good idea, um, but that it meets the strict scrutiny of compelling interest and um, that it's narrowly tailored to be the least intrusive kind of law possible. And so that will be a constitutional amendment. That means that if it passes this session, we'll all see it on the ballot this fall. This fall, okay, yep. that we can be able to vote on. Yep, yep. Uh, and, and very good, I, I like it. Well, and re you. responsibility as well, right? Yes. With parents. Well, the, Gives them decision yes. making and you know, making sure that they're, they're, they're responsible for and mm -hmm. be able to make decisions for. Well, of course, and right. um, it's that's already how we consider parental rights, right. but this will codify it in our Constitution right. to be sure that it's protected. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which one and, more? Okay, one more for now. Yes. Um, House Bill 383. This one is going to require, no, this gets a little in the weeds, so okay. it's going to require that insurance companies will submit the proper information to the State Insurance Commission when their, if and when, their business begins to fail. Oh, wow. And this was requested because, as we've seen after I'd, our most recent hurricane, right. sometimes when someone is in the middle of a claim and their insurance company goes under, they're having to wait months and sometimes even years um, before the, the claim can be resolved because this, the commissioner is still waiting for the in, information coming from the insurance company so that they can step in and help with the guarantee fund. And, and so it... it from what I'm hearing, that's basically insurance transparency. You have some transparency about how well your organization can fund and provide the services that you claim that you can mm -hmm. claim with yeah. claims. Now, what this this is uh, just a minor change in that they already have to give this information. It's this just when. makes it so that they give it early enough in the process so that if they do go under, the information is already in the hands of the guarantee fund and people's claims can be processed in a more timely manner. As so we mentioned three of those, let's go mm -hmm. through the other two, sure. if you don't mind. Oh, sure, yes. Um, another is House Bill 415, and this one has to do with banking. We've heard a lot in, in articles and headlines about central bank digital currency. So this is an attempt to put into law that central bank digital currency is not going to be recognized in Louisiana. It's not going to be the standard here. So we will continue with all the forms of currency we currently have. Okay. Okay. And then another is House Bill 469. This one is about licensing for plumbers. It seems that, in my observation, I haven't gotten the official statistics in for uh, the current year, but in my observation, the average age of plumbers is in the mid to upper 50s. Yep. And so the bulk may be retiring pretty soon, and we're not seeing a big growth in the number of younger plumbers coming in to replace them. So we are headed for a plumbing shortage, a plumber's shortage, <laughs> and um, right now, contractors are having trouble because there are certain jobs that they may not even be able to bid on because they don't know that they can hire the number of plumbers that are needed for those jobs. And in our area and in most rural communities around the state, becoming a plumber has an additional burden right now because the law has been changed in recent years so that you can only become a plumber, a journeyman plumber, if you have taken part in the approved apprenticeship program. and. Um, it used to be that you could sit for the exam after so many thousand hours of being a plumber's helper. Right. Well, the bill is an attempt to bring that option back. We don't want to do away with the apprenticeship program, but right. we want to make another option. And um, it also is an attempt to increase the number of learning plumbers that a journeyman can supervise. Right now, it's one. Uh, just one. And so yeah. that's why the apprenticeship program is not popular in our area. So if we can at least increase that to two, that's going to be a help. Yeah, it may double that. And, and yeah. it doesn't have anything to do with the efficacy of that plumber. No. It just has to do with regards to 
making sure that they, they're doing what they can, making it a little bit easier to have more people become a plumber. Well, they're going to be doing the same kind of work and the same amount of work, really. Right. Um, it just gives another option for what qualifies you to sit for the plumbing exam. Right, and become a journeyman plumber. Yes, for a journeyman plumber. Gotcha. Um, and then I have two resolutions, and one of them is to set up a task force to look into what we might be able to do f with uh, agricultural field burning. Um, oh, in okay. our area, it's mostly sugarcane. Right. In other areas, it's rice and right. other crops. Um, and that's because sometimes the smoke from field burning has caused accidents, and there have been yeah. many deaths. And, Problems, and, right. And, and also, every year, I get complaints during the burning season from people who can't breathe. And so we know that there are laws in place. We know that, that good farmers are not attempting to harm anyone. Sure. But we also know the weather can change without notice, and we also know that sometimes it appears that what the laws that are in place are not being fully enforced and so i'm hoping that the task force can come up with some solutions oh terrific yeah. and, and the last one yep uh, the last one um, it's to urge the department of education to present the version of the early learning standards that's daycare curriculum standards right. to bessie for consideration because there have been some tremendous delays in the process for getting these standards approved and the, the task force that had been, or the commission that had been meeting um, has had trouble getting a quorum at least three meetings in a row now. Wow. And so we really need to get a move on. It's been a year. Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. Now let's talk a little bit about this process that not everybody knows about budget and, and how that yep. works. Sure. Um, well, the budget has been, the, the governor's budget has been proposed already. Right. And the finance, the appropriations committee has already been meeting with departments to to see how it might need to be adjusted. But um, what we're looking at, I wanted to give you a little overview. Um, last year, our total state budget was $47 billion. This year, the total proposed budget, that's for fiscal year 23-24, um, is $50 billion. So it has grown significantly. Yes, it has. And it's a, yet again another record, a record-setting budget. Right. Um, and also, the amount of the budget that's coming from federal funds is $23.8 billion. So that means almost half of our state total budget is coming from the federal government. That yeah. means Louisiana is one of the most federal government dependent states. And I think we need to work on that. Right. Um, of the budget, the total budget, only 11.4 billion is um, state general fund. And only the state general fund can be touched and moved around by the legislature. Right. And honestly, most of that's locked up. So now we're down to 3.1 billion that we call discretionary. That means the legislature can actually move it around as needed. And um, some other statistics on top of that. Um, you may have heard about the 0.45% sales tax that rolls right. off in the future. Right. It officially rolls off July 1st of 25. 25, okay. 25. So um, right now, that 0.45% sales tax results in about $443 million of our, of our um, state budget. And so... Our total sales tax is 4.4 billion, but somehow 0.45% sales tax is 10% of the overall 4.5 state portion. Mm. Uh, oh, that's 10%. Right. And so mathematically, my mind is still trying to wrap around that. Yeah, trying to make sense of it. Yeah. And the other thing that makes it difficult, as you mentioned to me, is the language of oh, how yes. it's all written and how the to, vocabulary. How yes. to, to really kind of figure out what everything means as you oh, go right. through. And coming from a bookkeeping background, I'm, I'm used to certain common words like revenue, right. spending, right. expenditure. But then we have this other vocabulary that's kind of unique maybe to Louisiana. And so we have to know what's the rainy day fund right. and, and what can it be used out. for? Right. And what is an off-budget account? Right. And so there's, yeah. there's so many words you have to learn to even yeah. know what they're talking about. Beryl, cannot uh, thank you enough for your time. We sure. appreciate appreciate the updates. All right, that will do it for this particular segment of Bayou Time. Don't go anywhere. A whole lot more local programming right here on HTV. <laughs>